So in this video we're looking at chemical kinetics for grade 12 chemistry or AP chemistry and we're going to look at reaction mechanisms, a quick introduction or review. So we're given here a three-step reaction mechanism for a reaction. So a reaction where the collisions happen in three different steps. And we're asked a few questions on the side. If you think you know what you're doing, pause the video and try to answer the questions yourself. So the first one says, what are the intermediates in this reaction? The intermediates, we remember, are products in an early step of a mechanism that become reactants again in a later step of the mechanism. So they'll appear on the right-hand side, the product side of an early step in the mechanism, and then they'll be on the left-hand side, a reactant side, later on. So we'll cancel them out in the mechanism. So here we see an N2O2 particle being produced, but in the very next step, the N2O2 particle is a reactant. So N2O2 is an intermediate. Another intermediate, the N2O that's produced in step two, is used up immediately in step three. So the N2O is an intermediate. In those two examples, the product was used up in the very next step. That doesn't always happen. Sometimes a product in step one might be used up in step three. It would still be considered an intermediate. Now, are there any things that appear on the left-hand side of the equation, but then later on the right-hand side? If so, those would be called catalysts. So we see here NOs on the left, but there's no NOs over here on the right. There's hydrogens here on the left, but there's no hydrogen on the right. So there are no catalysts in this mechanism. So anything that we didn't cancel out is considered the overall reaction. So in the reactant side of the equation, we have two NOs, NO plus NO, and then we have two hydrogens. And on the right-hand side, we have N2, and we have two waters. So there's your overall reaction. The order that you write them in doesn't matter. You could have said two H2s plus two NOs. You could have said two H2Os plus an N2. That doesn't matter. Now we have underneath the mechanism a potential energy diagram for that reaction. And just like there were three steps in the mechanism, we see there's three bumps or three hills in the diagram. The question says, which of the steps in the mechanism was the rate determining step? Now sometimes when you see the mechanism, you'll see the words slow or fast beside each step. That's a relative term, so slow simply means the slowest of the three steps, and fast just means uh, faster than the slow step. We don't have those words in the mechanism here, but we have the PE diagram, the potential energy diagram. So we can look at step one, where the reactants are here, and realize that in step one, to create the products of step one, the intermediates, which would be here, we need to have this activation energy. So this, this difference in energy of potential energy is the activation energy for step one. Similarly, step two begins here, and to create step two's products, the intermediates in step two, we need to have this much energy, which would be the Ea for step two. Step three has the very smallest Ea of those three steps. So the rate determining step is the slowest step of the mechanism. We remember that the larger the activation energy is, the fewer particles would have that much energy. And if fewer particles have that much energy, that step would be the slowest. So the largest activation energy means the slowest step in the mechanism. So in this case, step one, okay? The step with the largest activation energy is the slowest step of the mechanism. called the rate determining step because the slowest step determines the rate of the overall process. The entire reaction can only go as fast as the slowest step of the mechanism. The final question says if the reaction were in a closed flask, would the temperature inside the flask go up or go down during the reaction? Well that's really just asking is this an endothermic or exothermic reaction? 
So to find out, we look at the potential energy diagram, and we can see that the overall delta H, the difference between the beginning reactants and the final products, is this difference in the diagram here. That's delta H overall. And you began with a higher energy, and you finished with a lower energy. So that tells me energy was released, or produced, and the overall delta H is therefore negative. If the delta H overall is negative, it's an exothermic reaction. You're losing energy. So this would be an exothermic process. So heat is released. The products have less energy than the reactants. If heat is released, therefore the temperature will rise in the flask. Okay, so inside that flask, this chemical reaction is releasing heat. It's producing heat. That heat is causing the temperature inside the flask to rise. Okay? It's not that there's heat being lost from the flask. It's that the heat from the reaction in the flask is, uh, sorry, the, the reaction inside the flask is producing heat, and that heat is causing the temperature inside to go up. Okay, question number two, pause the video and see if you can answer those questions about this two-step reaction mechanism. So we wanted the overall reaction, so just like before, we'll cancel out anything that appears on both sides of the equation. So the NO3 in step one is produced, and then it's used up again in step two, so we'll cancel it out produced in an early step and then used up in a later step, that means the NO3 is a catalyst. Sorry, an intermediate. Is there anything else that appears on both sides? Well, there's an NO2 on the left, and on the second step, an NO2 is on the right, so we can cancel out an NO2. When something is initially a reactant and then later a product, that is a catalyst. So the NO2 is a catalyst. So anything that we haven't cancelled out is our overall reaction. So we have NO2 reacts with carbon monoxide CO producing NO and CO2. There's the overall reaction. Which of the steps has the smaller activation energy? The smaller EA means that this is the faster step. Okay, if it's got a lower activation energy, more particles will be able to react successfully. It'll be a faster reaction. So looking up at the mechanism, step two was, was labeled fast. So this is step two. Would increasing the concentration of carbon monoxide, square brackets means concentration, affect the rate of the reaction? Now, carbon monoxide is one of the reactants in the overall reaction. So you might think that, from theory, the rate of the reaction is dependent on the concentration of reactants. But we look up at the mechanism and we look at our slow step, the rate-determining step of the mechanism, and we notice that there are, there's no carbon monoxide molecules in that step. There's no CO among the reactants there. And that tells me that the rate of this overall reaction really only depends on the concentration of NO2. So even though carbon monoxide is a reactant in the overall reaction, its concentration will not affect the overall rate because carbon monoxide is not part of the rate determining step. So no, carbon monoxide will not affect the rate because the carbon monoxide is not in the slow step. It's not a reactant in the rate determining step. Now that might be a bit of an oversimplification, but for an introductory level, that's a pretty good understanding. Question number three, again, pause the video and see if you can answer those questions regarding that three-step reaction mechanism. So we are asked, is there a catalyst in this mechanism? 
catalysts are substances that appear as a reactant first, and then later they, they appear as a product. Okay? We also need to find intermediates, and we need to find a missing product in step two. So let's jump in and try this. Um, HOCl is being produced in step one. It's used up in step two. So a product, and then later it's a reactant. That means the HOCl was an intermediate. The HOBr is produced in step two, and it's used up in step three. So just like the HOCl, the HOBr is an intermediate. Now looking up here, water in step one is a reactant. The water in step three is a product. So on opposite sides, we cancel it out. But it was a reactant first and a product later. That means the water was a catalyst in the, in the, in the reaction. I think there's one other intermediate here that we can write. The hydroxide was produced in step one, and then in step three, it's a reactant. So the hydroxide ion is actually another intermediate. So there are actually three intermediates in this mechanism. So whatever's left should equal the overall reaction. So let's just double check. A ClO minus in the overall reaction, well, that's here, ClO minus in step one. Bromide in step is an overall reaction reactant, so bromide is a reactant there in step two, not crossed out. So there's the two reactants in the overall reaction. And the products, the BRO minus is here, so in step three, produced, that's good. But where's this chloride ion? I don't see any chloride ion, and then I realize that's what's missing in step two as a product. The Br minus collided with HOCl, producing HOBr and Cl minus. So now that's balanced, and it gives me the missing product. So the missing product was chloride ion. Now we're told in Part D, the potential energy diagram is shown. Label each step in the mechanism as being fast or slow. So really what I want to focus on first is the rate determining step, the slowest step. So in step one, the reactants begin with this energy, and to create the activated complex, that amount of energy I've just labeled there is my Ea, the activation energy for step one. Step two begins here at B, and to create its activated complex, you need this activation energy, Ea, for step two. And step three begins here at C, and to create its activated complex, you need this amount of energy, which is Ea step three. So the rate determining step, the slowest step in the mechanism, has the largest activation energy, so clearly that's step three. So step three, we can go up here and call that the slow step. It's the rate determining step, the step with the largest activation energy. And then finally, the other two steps will be faster than that one, so we'll just label them fast. Okay? And finally, based on this diagram, is the overall reaction endothermic or exothermic? Well, why don't we actually look at each of the three steps, since they're there. Step one begins here at A and finishes here at B, and B has less energy than A. So step one was exothermic. Its delta H would be negative. It's releasing heat. Step two starts at B and ends at C, and it's also producing heat. It's releasing energy because C ends up being lower energy than B. So step two is also exothermic. And step three begins here at C and finishes at D. So step three is also exothermic. It's losing energy. But the question asked about the overall reaction, which begins at A and finishes at D, and so yes, definitely you're ending up at lower energy than you began, so the overall reaction is exothermic, and delta H overall would be negative. So I hope that's a good review for you of reaction mechanisms connected to potential energy diagrams.